Well, this morning, as I've already told you, we're returning to the Sermon on the Mount, and what we're going to look at uh, this morning are verses 17 through 20. I'm almost tempted to read the uh, Beatitudes again, but I'll trust you're very familiar with those. Uh, let, let's just go ahead and begin in verse 17. And uh, again, what we're going to look at here is what Jesus is essentially telling uh, his disciples and, and those who would gather to hear. <coughs> what it is he was going to do to enable them to, to go beyond what the scribes and the Pharisees had been teaching them up to this point. And again, <clears throat> what they had been teaching them um, was, uh, Jesus is going to make numerous corrections here. It was wrong. I mean, there are some areas where they intersected with the truth, but in many cases didn't go far enough. In other cases, they were just kind of lowering the standard so that they could keep it. If you believe that your salvation depended upon your works, you would want to make sure the standard was somewhere where you could keep it, right? Well, that's how they understood the law of God. If they just keep the bare words of the law, I mean, keep from murdering somebody, keep from committing adultery, uh, making sure you honor your parents and so forth, just on the face value, it looks like it's doable, right? And then you have sacrifices in case you fail in some areas and so forth. But Jesus is going to point out to us that it reaches far beyond just, just the face value of, the, of these words. It reaches to the heart, reaches to the mind, reaches to the words. But Jesus came, as I've said, in order to give us the ability. Well, actually, I say he came for two reasons. He came to justify us, to save us, by his keeping of the law. But he also came to give us the power, by his Holy Spirit, to keep it as well. And that's what we read about here. So beginning in verse 17, Jesus says this. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, throughout uh, the entire last month, remember, we were looking at the Reformation. And not just because we recently passed the 500th anniversary of when it started, but because of the importance of that particular event. Because this event reminds us of the most important thing that we will ever learn. And that is that we can be reconciled to God. We can be saved only through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that we will ever escape that very real hell that was waiting for us outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way that we'll ever be considered good enough to spend an eternity with God is by turning from our sins and trusting Jesus Christ alone, trusting in his perfect righteousness, the life that he lived, and his payment on the cross. Remember, that's what we labor the entire last month, justification, which is the most important thing. God's declaration that we are righteous is by grace alone. Basically, it's a free gift. God is the one who does it all through Jesus, and he offers it to us and gives it to us as a gift of his grace, and that it might be a gift, that it might be by grace alone, we must receive it through faith alone, by looking to Jesus Christ, looking away from all of our works, everything we have done, looking to Jesus and what he has done alone to justify us. That is the most important thing we could ever possibly know. That was something that we saw that was buried by the church in that day, but something the Lord revealed to Luther as he got back into the original languages, saw what the scriptures actually said, and he was saved. And then he began to proclaim this same truth. Now, this truth, of course, is, is important not only for us, 
I mean, we, we, it's important for us because we need to trust Jesus if we are to see heaven, but it's also important for other people as well because Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. There's not many ways to God. All these religions that exist in the world are not all valid religions that can reconcile you to God. The gospel is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Now, that's why we spend time looking at, at this only way, but it's also one of the reasons why we contrast what the Lord actually says in his word with what other people believe so that we might not only avoid their mistakes, but so that we might also help them to see their mistakes and to avoid them as well and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes you have to point out the errors in other people's system before they're gonna be able to see the truth, although we do need to focus on the truth. So it's important that we understand that justification, God's declaration that we are righteous and worthy to enter into heaven only comes through Jesus by trusting in him, by turning from our sins and trusting in him alone. But now we also saw last month that it's equally important to understand the rest of the equation, that the faith by which we are justified, by which we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, is never alone. We need to remember what James tells us in James 2, verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. If we have a faith that doesn't transform our lives, it doesn't produce works, it's a dead faith that cannot save us. True saving faith will transform our lives. A justifying faith is a faith that works. Now that's what we are actually looking at in the Beatitudes before we started the Reformation series. Remember, in the Beatitudes, Jesus here was not just simply giving us a list of qualifications, things that we needed to develop in our own lives before we could receive the promised reward. The rewards that he actually mentions here are the, the blessings of his kingdom that are all a part of the salvation package. Um, when Jesus says, for instance, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus isn't telling us that we must humble ourselves and basically do this work of becoming a servant before the kingdom of heaven will belong to us. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you actually have this quality, this nature, this character, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. We need to make sure we do not read what Jesus is saying here as a basically a list of works we are to do in order to receive salvation. What he's telling us is what justifying faith actually looks like. What changes the Spirit of God makes in our lives. The qualities that he creates in us to make us more like the Savior. So just by way of review, what is it that we should see in our lives if we're actually trusting uh, the Savior in a saving way? Well, I've already told you one, we should have a servant's heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We should be the kind of person who's not looking at other people to see how they can meet my need, but rather looking around for the needs that need to be met so that, that I can meet those needs, that I would be the servant and, and not the served. Uh, the second thing was grieving over sins. That when we see people doing things that we know are dishonoring to the Lord and we know are hurtful to them, that it would affect our hearts, that we would grieve or mourn or be saddened by those things, that we would have a kind and gentle spirit and not be harsh, a heart that is growing in its desire to do what God calls us to do and, and to really have a heart that is, that is aimed entirely in that direction, that we would have a heart full of mercy towards others that we would have the desire to bring peace where there is no peace. I mean, all of these Beatitudes essentially are describing Jesus because this is the kind of person that Jesus is. And this is what we should see being formed in us if we have the faith that actually justifies. You know, we'll also find ourselves being treated the way Jesus was treated. 
those who love Jesus will love us, but those who hate Jesus will also hate us. And of course, being hated for his sake is, is really not a bad thing, but a good thing because if we are being treated like Jesus, it means that we're becoming like Jesus, enough to, um, for the world to take notice and to actually treat us like we are Jesus. And of course, if we're becoming like Jesus, it also means we're going to be having the effect on this world that the Lord wants us to have. If we are like Jesus, our presence is going to have a preserving effect on the people around us. It's going to be like salt uh, because it's going to restrain the sins that other people want to do. Our presence is also going to have um, our, our character and, and, of course, our message particularly is also going to provide a source of truth a source of light that can give hope to a world that is essentially hopeless. We are going to be what our Lord actually made us to be, salt and light uh, in the world. Now, as I've said, we are saved by grace through faith alone, but we are not saved by a, by a faith that is alone. It will be accompanied by these kinds of qualities and these kinds of good works. Now, what Jesus moves on to do from here is relate these changes to the law of God. Okay, so far we're talking about certain qualities, humility of spirit, grieving over sins, and so forth. But how does this relate to the law of God? What is going to change with regard to our relationship to it and the way that we keep it? Now, his disciples that were listening, as well as the Jews who were also listening, were undoubtedly wondering exactly the same thing. How Jesus, how what he was teaching on this particular occasion, as well as what Messiah, our Lord Jesus the Christ, actually came into the world to do, they were wondering how this would fit with what they had already been taught, at least taught by their, their leaders, their teachers. Now, their teachers, the scribes and the Pharisees, had been telling them that obedience to the law of God was the way to receive the blessings and to enter into heaven. God gave you the law. Here's the standard. Keep it. Do this and you will live. God has provided a way for forgiveness if you happen to mess up. He's provided grace. Remember, he gave them the priesthood. He gave them the sacrifices, which if they sacrificed their sins would be forgiven. And, of course, you needed faith. You needed to believe the promise of God so that you would do what it is he called you to do. And if you happen to sin, you would seek him in the way that he has provided through the sacrifices. That's the way the scribes and the Pharisees viewed the Old Testament system. They didn't see it the way it was actually supposed to be seen. Seeing in those sacrifices a picture of the Messiah and looking forward to him and believing in him like Abraham. Remember, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And Jesus says later in John chapter 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Abraham looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. He trusted in him. He received his righteousness. His sins were forgiven and he was justified. That's exactly what the old covenant people of God should have been doing, looking to Jesus. But instead, they were looking to the sacrifices. They were looking to their own obedience as their justification before God. By the way, I just want to point out, they were making exactly the same mistake that Rome made. The Roman Catholic Church made in the days of the Reformation and continued to make today, believing that our justification, our right standing with God, in some way depends upon our works and it is not entirely by God's grace. Well, Jesus now goes on to tell them that uh, what he basically had, had just told them as, what is, as well as what he was going to do, that this would not do away with the law of God. What he had said in the Beatitudes and his work in general was not going to do away with the law of God. It was not going to abolish the law of God. You know, again, when you think the idea that we're saved by works, you'd be tempted to think that, okay, here's the system of works, but if it's going to be by grace, then you're going to do away with the system of works. Jesus says that even though he's coming to bring salvation, that it's not going to do away with obedience, it's not going to do away with the law. Rather, Jesus was coming to give them the power to 
obey the law of God in a way that they had never obeyed it before and in a way their teachers had not obeyed it. So Jesus is going to fulfill the law to give them the power to keep the law. Okay? And essentially, he's saying the same thing with regard to the law that he was saying with regard to the Beatitudes. I'm going to give you the power to do these things. It's not do this and you will live, but I will do this in you, and this will show that you really are alive. So first of all, let's consider in the text that we're looking at this morning what Jesus was not saying he was not saying that he came to do away with the law of God. And I want to bring out that point because there's a lot of people who actually believe that's what he's saying here. Now, last week, as we were looking at the Reformation series, listening to R.C. Sproul, he brought up uh, three different views of the relationship of faith and works to justification. Now, he, he brought up one view that's called the antinomian view. That uh, to contrast it with Rome's view and with the, the view that we hold, which is the reform view, on the matter of justification. Now, let me start with Rome. Rome believes, as I've said before, that faith, our belief, along with the works that we do, actually results in justification. To put it simply, we believe, and so we work, and so we are saved. Okay, so we put it this way, faith plus works equals justification. Or, and I'm using justification and salvation as basically synonymous terms. Now, the Reformers believe that faith alone, trusting in Jesus alone, results in justification and works. We believe and we're saved solely on the basis of faith and our lives are transformed by that faith. We are empowered to do good works. So faith results in or equals uh, justification plus good works. Now the antinomians that I mentioned before are basically those who believe that the law no longer applies, that Jesus actually came to abolish it. They believe that faith results in justification without works. We believe and that results in our salvation but we are completely unchanged. Nothing changes. We're still the same person we were before. We'll live the same way that we were before unless we decide we want to get serious and then we can get serious. Now, on that particular evening, the question was asked, where would they ever get an idea like that, that the law of God is no longer valid? Well, here's one of the, those places that they actually point to. Jesus says in verses 17 through 18 of Matthew 5, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, they believe that what Jesus means here is that the law of God would be done away with once it had been fulfilled, once everything had, in the law had been accomplished. Well, Jesus fulfilled it, and so it must be now abolished. It must be done away with. It must no longer be in force. Now, let me just tell you, that's not what Jesus is actually saying here, and he can't mean that. If he, if he means that, everything else he says in this text is meaningless. Now, first of all, he just told us in verse 18 that not the smallest letter or stroke will pass away from the law until everything has been accomplished. He was not speaking here about his fulfillment of the law as far as everything being accomplished, but everything in God's plan until his plan for this world is complete. When heaven and earth pass away, remember, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke will pass away from the law until everything is accomplished, everything that God has planned for this world. When the heavens and the earth pass away, when the Lord has brought in the new heavens and the new earth, that law which he gave to us to govern our lives in this world will come to an end because we won't need it in the world to come because in that world we will be perfect. Remember what Paul said to Timothy, law was not made for a righteous man, Law was made for the ungodly. Uh, 
It, it's meant to restrain them. It's meant to point out sin where there is sin, but where there is no sin, there's no need for the law. So once everything is accomplished, then the law will pass away, but not until then. Now second, the law couldn't have been abolished by the work of Jesus because of what he says in the next verse, in verse 19. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us here, if we take the smallest of the commandments and we disregard and say it's unimportant and we encourage other people to do the same thing with, with that commandment, that we will be considered among the least of the members of the kingdom of heaven, that is, among God's people. But if we keep them and we encourage others to do the same thing, even the, the least and most insignificant of the commandments, we will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. Basically, Jesus is telling us that our status in the kingdom and God's estimation of us will be based upon how we receive and keep and encourage others to keep the commandments of the Lord. Now, if that's true of even the least and most insignificant commandment, what does it say about those who take the entire law and, and say it's abolished and push it aside? How do they rank in the kingdom of heaven? Well, we need to be careful because if even the least and insignificant, what about the greatest and most important that they've just done away with and say it's unimportant? This is a warning against the idea of antinomianism. Now, thirdly, consider the warning he gives in verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if, if we abolish and disregard the law of God, how can our righteousness be greater than theirs? How are we going to enter the kingdom of heaven if we disregard the commandments? Now, we could also add to these arguments that we are called as Christians to follow Jesus' example. And what is it that Jesus actually did? His whole life was a continual sacrifice of obedience to the commandments. You know, he came into the world to fulfill the commandments, to give a perfect obedience so that we could have a perfect righteousness given to us. That's the example Jesus gave us to follow, isn't it? But his example is one who obeyed the law of God perfectly. If we're going to follow Jesus' example, can we just take the law and, and abolish it, push it aside, say it's passed away? No, if we're going to follow Jesus' example, if we're going to walk as he walked, we need to obey the commandments. Now, the scripture also says that we are called to love. That's essentially what righteousness is all about. But Paul tells us that the commandments themselves are the actual definition of love. He writes in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Notice that there's the command, love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. It's interesting, isn't it, that the work Jesus did was to bring his Holy Spirit back into our hearts to give us love so that we would be able to keep the law of God. That's, that's really what the blessing of the new covenant is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in the book of Hebrews, he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them in these days. I will take my laws and put them in their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I shall be their God and they shall be my people. He was essentially saying, I'm going to give my spirit to them. I'm going to put my spirit in them and I'm going to give them the desire to obey and they will obey and they will be my people. All of these things argue the law of God could not have been abolished. Rather, Jesus fulfilled the law so that we would be able to keep it. And that, that brings us to the second point. 
I just want to make sure you understand Jesus is not telling us here that he came to fulfill and abolish the law. I hear, I've heard a number of people argue, well, Jesus kept that law, and since he kept it, and since I have his righteousness, I don't need to keep it. Well, you see, that kind of a spirit, that kind of a heart, essentially tells you that person doesn't even know Jesus. Because if they did, they would want to be like Jesus, who didn't set aside even the least of the commandments, but he kept them all. So if Jesus isn't saying that he came to do away with the law, what is he saying? Well, he's telling us he came to fulfill it. He came to explain it, to tell us what it really means. That's what, what we're going to see as we go through this particular chapter. He came to show us what it means by giving us a perfect example of one who actually is following the law of God. And he came to keep it in order that he might justify us with his perfect righteousness and that he might give us the power also to keep it. Again, he says in verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. And what could be clearer than that? Don't think that I came to abolish it. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Now, I do want you to notice here what he's saying, that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's not talking here only about the moral law. He is talking here, the Ten Commandments, he's talking here about the law and the prophets, which is really a, a term that was used by the Jews to, uh, well, to, to uh, what's the word I'm looking for, identify the Old Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. Don't think that I've come to abolish the Old Testament. I haven't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Everything that's in the entire Old Testament. Now, he fulfilled the moral law by his obeying it perfectly. He fulfilled the ceremonial law, okay, by his once-for-all sacrifice on the cross. Remember, we, we have a better sacrifice from a better priest. It's a once-for-all sacrifice that forever cleanses us of sins. And he fulfilled the ceremonial law through his continual intercession for us in heaven. Jesus is our great high priest who is right now in heaven praying for us, which is what the priests would do in the Jewish culture. He fulfilled the civil law. The, the reason why the civil law existed was to keep Israel as a separate entity and to keep them in existence until Jesus could come and do his work. And once he did, that, that state of Israel essentially ceased to exist, which means the civil law those particular applications cease to exist except for the principle of justice and righteousness that they contain. We find those principles and we apply them now to, to our culture. But the point is this, Jesus did not fulfill the law, the moral law, to set it aside. He fulfilled it to do two things to become the source of our justification and to become the source of our power to obey. Now, we've, we looked all last month at the first, God declares us to be righteous because of Jesus' obedience, because of Jesus' death. We are justified by grace through faith alone. That is our salvation. That is our entrance into heaven. That is what matters most of all. But the second truth is also very, very important because it's how we know that we actually have a faith that justifies. Jesus obeyed so that he might give us the power to obey. And let me just remind you again of what Paul says in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now that requirement of the law undoubtedly has to do with, with imputed righteousness when we trust in Jesus, his obedience is credited to our account but it also has to do with actually fulfilling in reality those requirements in us. We actually do become like Jesus. We actually do become more obedient when we walk not according to the desires of our flesh because they are against the law, they hate the law, but when we walk according to the Spirit who is that principle of love or desire for the law. We, we always have those two choices that we have to make or the choice between the two different desires. My flesh is saying, don't do that, but the Spirit is saying, do it because it's good. 
We need to yield to the Spirit, and we need to walk according to the desires He gives us. And when we do, we see these requirements. We see the law essentially being fulfilled in us. We are obeying it. Now, again, that's why the Reformers believed. What James also clearly tells us, as we've seen, that we are justified, we are saved by a faith that is not alone. Jesus, through his work, has given us a spirit. And with his spirit, the desire and so the power to obey. You know, we were, when we came into this world, we were in chains. We basically were in bondage to sin because all we wanted to do was sin. But once that new desire is present, that frees us from our bondage to sin. Now we have another desire that moves us away from sin. Now we can obey. So sin is no longer our master. We are no longer its slave. He gives us the desire and the power to obey so that we might enter into his kingdom. And again, that's how we make sense of verse 20. For Jesus says there, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus here is not talking about his imputed righteousness, although that's certainly true. Without that, we won't enter the kingdom. But he's actually talking here about our personal righteousness, the way we obey. Unless our obedience is greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, our righteousness, our obedience would be no better than theirs if we didn't have the Spirit. But since we have the Spirit, it will be greater. And just how, how much greater will it be? Well, it depends on how much we yield to the Spirit of God, but it will be greater. We will actually obey, not just the commandments on the face of them, not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. We will do what the, what's really behind the commandments. We'll not only not take away someone's life, we also won't hate them. And we also won't you know, blast them with our tongues and say nasty things about them as we're going to see this evening. We're not only not going to commit adultery in our actions, but we also won't commit them in our minds because we're gonna want to do what the Lord calls us to do. And everything that we do is not going to be out of hypocrisy like it is with the scribes and Pharisees, doing it to keep up appearances. But we're going to do it because we really want to do it, because we really love the Lord, and we really want to give Him honor. Our obedience, our righteousness will be much greater than theirs personally, and certainly it will be perfect from the standpoint of Christ's perfect righteousness. So in closing, let me just simply ask a few questions. Is this, what I'm describing here, is this what you see in yourself? The kind of obedience that Jesus is speaking of in the sermon. Do you see these qualities in the Beatitudes? Do you see the law of God actually being fulfilled in you? Do you see yourself obeying? You realize Jesus says that's what you need to see in yourself. It's true that you can't do it to get into the kingdom, it's true that he must do it, and if he does it, you will get into the kingdom, but if he's doing it, then you must be able to see it. You must notice those differences going on in your lives and see yourself living in this way, not, not perfectly, but growing more and more into the image of Jesus. We need to see these things if we're to enter into his kingdom, and we will see these things if we are actually trusting Jesus because, as we've already seen, this is the obedience that he actually gives to us. Now, if you do see that work of the Spirit in your heart making you more like Jesus, then you need to understand that you didn't do that. God did that. He did that by his mercy and his grace, all of grace. It's a free gift. And if he has done that in you, then make sure that you give him all the credit for that. That's the reason why we gather together for worship on the Lord's Day, it's not just to hear a sermon. It's not just to sing songs and pray. But it's to thank God, worship God, glorify God for what it is he has done for us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to the table, remember, this is purely the work of God. But now let me just say, if you don't see these things in, in your lives then understand this morning, you need to come to the only one who can actually do this work 
in your heart, you need to come to Jesus. And the way you do that is you turn from your sins and you look to Jesus, He's not with your physical eyes, but with, by faith, and you trust him. You cast your, yourself upon him and you look to him as your only hope of entering into heaven. And the Bible says that if you look to Jesus and you trust in him alone for your salvation, he will save you and he will change you in the way that we've been seeing that he will. Now, I've already told you Jesus is going to move on from here to explain to us what the commandments really mean, you know, as over against what the Jewish teachers were teaching, what, what the commandments were really after. Tonight, we're going to look at the sixth commandment as Jesus begins with that particular one. Uh, and so I hope you'll be able to be here uh, for that, again, as a means of encouragement and also as a means of self-examination because th this, is, this is very convicting. Uh, and we need to, you know, not allow ourselves to do particular things, which Jesus is going to point out here. And I think he ends up pointing out, I think, the areas where we're more likely to break these commandments than, than any other way. So Jesus isn't dealing with abstract things that don't really come in contact with reality. He's talking here about things that we have to struggle with every single day. We need to know that what he addresses here is wrong you know, that we are not to hate in our hearts, but we also need to know where we're going to find the power to be able to love the way the Lord calls us to love. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to examine ourselves, uh, particularly as we prepare to come to the table, because what we've just looked at is what we need to find in ourselves before we come to the table. Otherwise, again, there's the, the issue of discipline. And we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. For now, let's just, let's just pray and ask the Lord to apply what we've heard.